Hello everybody and welcome to our fourth and final installment of Reimagining Race Through the Eyes of God. I just want to say as we close out this series, I am so thankful for you. I'm thankful that you have been here for this. I'm thankful for our church family that allows us the space to lean in to some difficult conversations, to have some hard talks in order that we might go further, that in order that we might grow, in order that we might ultimately become unified, that we might become one as God envisioned. Uh, I have called in the troops today. Uh, today, I am going to speak very little. Don't shout amen in the chat for that, please. Uh, well, I'm just going to speak a little bit, uh, but I've invited members of our family to come and share their experiences and their thoughts, their ideas, their perspectives on this topic. The reality is this, a lot of times we have family conversations around a dinner table with just a few people about hard topics, uh, topics like race. But today, and throughout this series, uh, our goal is to take that conversation out of, the, out of the kitchen and bring it into the family room and invite all of the extended members of the family into this conversation. Why? So that over time, we'll be able to, to touch back into this conversation. We'll be able to have a shared language, a shared understanding, a shared set of uh, of, of beliefs and ideas and experiences around this topic so that we can not just stay where we are, but that we can move forward, that we can begin to fulfill the calling that God has put on us to bring people and God together in love. Today, I'm excited to bring part four. It's called Family Talk and Family Walk. Family Talk and Family Walk. Walk. We call it that because we're not just here uh, to diagnose the problem. We're here to heal the problem. We're not here to just have conversation. Uh, we're here to inspire action. We're, we're not here to just reflect on where we've been. We're here to encourage one another and empower one another to move forward, uh, to, to bring real healing, real transformation to our world. I want to start by reading a scripture this morning from the book of Philippians. I love this scripture. It says, fulfill my joy uh, by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done, the scripture says, through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You see, God is calling us to have a transformation of our mind. He's calling us collectively to begin to think new about the issues of race and racism. Sometimes you have a paradigm in your mind. Sometimes you see things in one way and you need that paradigm to be broken and shifted so you can see things in a new way. If we're going to have the mind of Christ, that means some of our old thoughts and our old structures have to be broken down. I'm going to read you one more verse and then I'm going to invite uh, some, some voices from the family. Um, this is out of Romans 12. It says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given to me to everyone, everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. We, being many, are one body in Christ. And individually, we are members of one another. Today, as you listen to your brothers and sisters share their experiences, their thoughts, their ideas, and their feelings, I would ask that you just open your heart and open your mouth and pray, God, renew my mind. 
I became aware of the idea of race and racism all in one fell swoop. Uh, third grade, uh, St. Louis is home. I grew up in South City and I got bussed out to uh, West County. I shall not name the district. Um, and I was one of a few. And I can remember um, not having words to describe, but like, why don't people want to play with me? And not quite understanding like what this schism was, but like my child sized mind could fully comprehend something's not right here. I remember I was like seven or eight and uh, you know, one of the things I like to do as a kid, I, I like to ride bikes. And that, that was just like a social thing that I do with other kids. And uh, we were down there in the, in the yard and, and I saw this kid right next door riding bikes. I approached this kid in the neighborhood next over, and uh, or in the sorry, the house next over, and you know we started talking, and you know he, he one thing led to another. He was like, "Well, my dad has a bike. I can ask him if if, if you can ride it, and we can ride together." And so um, I followed him up, you know, his his front porch steps, and I'm standing on the the porch looking into the house, and the kid's already inside, and his dad's standing in the doorway, and his dad's not happy. And his dad flat out said it. His dad was like, you know, I don't let little Ambridge ride my, bi uh, ride my bike, is what he said. When did I first become aware of races, if you will? Um, that would be in the cotton fields in 1955 or late 50s. And I picked cotton, I had a Dixie Lily um, cotton bag that my mother made me. And the next row were black folks and so on, so, like that. Uh, we also lived next door to the people to black folks and it was Coretha and Lonnie. And they had two boys about my age. And they had a goat that pulled a wagon and I would get in that wagon with them. We, every weekend we'd roam the, you know, the woods and had a big time. In what ways does Sean has uh, race or racism impacted your life? In every way, every day. I, I don't have the luxury of not thinking about race or um, having race be something that falls, you know, way in the back of your mind. Um, Racists every day. Racism growing up, I was always aware of that. I actually had um, some relatives that were pretty explicitly racist, you know, using the N word, talking about those kinds of people. Um, I couldn't have a pool party at the end of the year. Uh, because there were a few black kids in my class. So for me growing up, racism was always sort of this like external problem. Um, but I didn't consider racism and kind of excavate where it was in my heart or in the hearts of the people in my circle or in the organizations I was a part of. I didn't even consider that until probably my 30s. I would say the epitome of race and racism in my life came early in third grade. We were in PE, who doesn't love PE, right? Um, so we were in PE and Adam B nailed, you know, yelled out in word, front of the whole class, right? And I am like, just, I, I'm stunned, right? Nobody had ever said that to me. Um, I didn't think it was that bad, but before I knew it, I was connecting a right hook because that's what the moment called for. I grew up kind of in a mixed neighborhood, projects um, in Brookline, Massachusetts. And uh, I've experienced racism in different uh, manners and ways. And there's ways that because I've experienced that through people making fun of me or thinking I can't do things because of my race. I didn't know that racial difference mattered until about third, fourth grade. And um, it was Monday morning coming in from the weekend. Um, everybody kind of assembled in the cafeteria before they were dismissed to their classroom. And I remember having a conversation with one of my classmates and he was talking about what he did over the weekend and uh, he had gone to a birthday party of one of his friends. He played like select baseball on a select baseball team. And uh, at the party, um, a guy was distributing kind of business cards and he turned to me and took out the business card that his father had received at that party and, uh, and showed it to me. 
And on the business card, there was an image of a white person in a hood, a coned hood, and the words Ku Klux Klan um, was on this business card. Jaden, my Jaden, my nephew I'm raising, was called a racial slur at school. And the crazy part about it is, I knew it was gonna happen at some point. It happens. And I didn't prepare him. And so I spent a lot of time going, oh God, I'm, I know what's gonna happen. Well, if you knew it was gonna happen, how come you didn't tell me it was gonna happen? I said, well, I, I thought I did tell you it was gonna happen. He says, no. And you didn't tell me what to do. So here I am knowing that, or really thinking at some point it's gonna happen and not preparing you to deal with it. That was part of the problem. But at the same time, I thought, okay, with your friends there, they also weren't prepared. It started the, the, the process of me being very aware of my skin color in a lot of different settings. That I think maybe some people didn't have an experience like that to where they don't have to think about it as much. But I was very sensitive to, to that. In Florida in 1964, I'm a long way from the cotton patch. I'm all white school. Uh, they passed the Civil Rights Act that year. I think it was 64. And the sheriff blocked black people from coming to our school. Said that, no, I don't care what they say, we're not doing this. And until 67, uh, they let the black people came in to our school. I'm gonna say we, we boys, uh, decide we're gonna give them a hard time when they come in. This is what we were talking about. And of course they came and I look, look at them and I see the girls first and I'm like, oh, you know, these are real, you know, I know they're real people, but I'm like, I saw them up close and personal. I hadn't seen any black folks in a really long time. I think there are many ways that race shows up. Uh, I think what most people don't realize is that as we eat and breathe and sleep, there are systems at play that have race inherently baked into it. If I go into a grocery store, if I go into a store, there are certain behaviors I've learned to do. It's ridiculous. I, but I've done it because it makes people feel uh, more comfortable. I'm less of a threat. Uh, and that happens all the time. What was funny is my folks actually socially, you know, social, socialized with them and everybody got along great. But when everybody was not together, they would nitpick them about the way they lived, the house they lived in, the housekeeping. And I think what struck me even at that age was like, we have the same house they do, and we live the same way they do. And I think the conclusion was, uh, not at that moment, but later on, everybody kind of needs somebody to look down on. But to be presented with this business card from my friend who had been at this party just two days ago, um, knowing that they were still real and present and um, a part of our society, that was when it really sunk in for me that race is a thing and it still matters. Um, so getting that business card with the Klan on it, uh, yeah, it just, it, 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 it was like a punch in the stomach um, to realize that people were out there that cared about the color of my skin that much. I don't know about you, but as I've been listening to these stories and as I'm soaking in the words of my brothers and sisters and their experiences in life, uh, it, 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 it expands my understanding. I'm, I'm, I'm opening my life and my mind to information that, that in some cases I wasn't aware of. That's one of the things that I love about this series is that even while preparing it, I've learned so much, I've grown so much. But we would be remiss if we stopped here, if we stopped in the mind, if we just stopped at the intellectual level. In fact, the scripture says this, the scripture uh, in the book of Ezekiel, God says uh, to his people, he says, uh, I will give you a new heart. I I'll put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you. 
as we listen to the stories and the reflections and the ideas of our family members and our friends, uh, let us not just keep it in our mind. Let us not just have our mind transformed, but let's allow God to stir our heart, to move our heart, to change our heart, to transform us so that we might be drawn closer in to who he wants us to be. So as we listen uh, to this next uh, series of conversations, I would ask you to do this. Pray, God, not only renew my mind, but God, revive my heart. I think generally, I would say I'm more hopeful than not. Um, I saw a quote earlier, earlier today that said, I'm not necessarily optimistic or pessimistic. I'm determined. I am hopeful about the future of race because this time is so, it's so new. It's such an era of opportunities and, and, and we're witnessing things that we've never witnessed before, like all coming together. Um, so this, this younger generation is a zero tolerance. I mean, they're into everything from the politics of it to um, standing up, even to family and friends. And that's, that's courage beyond courage. And it's not just, um, African-Americans, you've been fighting this fight forever. It, it's others. And that's where the power is. The power's in numbers. And so, yeah, I'm very hopeful. When I moved to a city where there was more diversity is also where I found my people a lot easier and more deeply than I had found them in the other places where we had lived in the Midwest. And um, they experienced, some of them experienced the results of the Trayvon Martin trial of George Zimmerman. Um, very differently than I thought we were going to. Um, so previously I would have, um, and in that moment, I really kind of had framed it as just sort of a tragedy, just almost an unavoidable tragedy um, because sometimes you're gonna make the wrong call and sometimes our laws aren't going to provide sort of an answer or a resolution for someone who's lost someone unjustly. And that's what I thought we were gonna be saying. And, um, their lack, some of my friends' lack of surprise um, was like a little offensive to me. Um, I don't know how much it was, a, it was obvious that it was, but I was surprised. I was surprised that, that there was sort of this, like we knew that was gonna happen. And I just felt that. I felt the thickness of that because it made me think back to all of the different stories that I've heard. And it's like, how many sort of like bad breaks can there be before you're like, this isn't the best way to do things? You know, when something isn't working for a certain group of people over and over and over, like at what point do you just say, that's not bad luck? But I'm hopeful because uh, I do believe that through Christ, um, we can have reconciliation. Over the, over the course of uh, the last few months, after George Floyd died, Breonna Taylor um, and others, like it seems like folks are more comfortable and vocal saying a simple truth that black life matters. Not that other folk, other lives do not matter, but there's a history and a pattern of uh, marginalization and oppression. And so we need to, to lift uh, black lives up. If we could imagine what the world could be like um, set right um, as, it, as it relates to racism, I would say number one, if we could just own our history of racism that each country, each people group, each institution would just own that. I got saved at 30 years old, I came to Christ. My heart actually changed 180 degrees. I was already friendly and nice and all that stuff, but my heart really changed. On principle, I really want to be hopeful because I feel like that's the right answer and I like right answers. And because on principle, I believe that people can change. I'm an example of that. I'm hopeful because I, I do see dialogues. I do see growth. I do see uh, people admitting like, hey, things have not been right in our history. And we need to admit that, talk about that, and then formulate, where do we go from here? Well, the word says we have a living hope. And um, I believe that the work that Jesus did when he was here came to, 
he, he came to interrupt and kind of, um, not kind of, to literally flip the tables over. Um, and so I think that's, uh, that's part of the work that we get to be a part of and seeing the changes that occurred. I mean, he changed the world, right? Um, and is still changing the world. And so my faith in, in him and in, and in God and in justice and in love, that definitely gives me hope on a daily basis. Wow, I am, I am so grateful for the courage uh, of our church family members, just opening their lives, sharing their stories, sharing their perspectives with us. I, I grew up in St. Louis, and one of the things that bugged me as a kid, something I couldn't understand, is why people live so separately from one another. Why did everybody live separately according to race, or so many of us? Uh, I, I guess I sort of arrived at the conclusion, though it didn't ever sit right with me, that, well, maybe people just want to live separately. White folks want to live with white folks. Black folks want to live with black folks. Folks, Asian and Hispanic people want to live among their own. Maybe that's just the reality. But the more I began to learn and the more I began to dig and the more I began to study, the more I realized, no, it, it wasn't a matter of preference. It had been a matter of policy. And let me explain what I mean. I, I live in University City. I live in a neighborhood that's relatively diverse, but it wasn't always so. In fact, I began to do some research on the house that I live in today. Uh, I went to the library and I asked for the copy of the governing document, the document that governs my subdivision. I was given our what's called indenture. This uh, is my neighborhood, University Park, and this indenture regulates the use of private boulevards, avenues, walks, uh, and alleys. Now, let me just tell you, this document is very long, and for the most part, it was extremely boring. It's all about gas lines, power lines, uh, sidewalks, trees, alleyways, trash, all the kinds of stuff uh, that I don't care that much about, to be honest. But I started reading a little further down the document, and in section two of clause E, I came across some interesting words. It said, owners may not use or permit to be used any house or houses by more than one family or, and then it says here in blue, words removed. So I said, huh, those words, whatever they were, were removed from the document. Let's still see what those words were. I read all the way down to the bottom of the document and I find this, that the words that had been removed from the document were the words, or by Negroes or Malays. So the first thing I had to do was look up the word Malays. It was an old 1920s uh, racial word that meant brown people, uh, uh, anybody brown. Uh, so what I figured out after reading this document, working through all the legalese, was that the document basically said, uh, this neighborhood is for white people only. Uh, you can't buy a house here. You can't rent a house here if you are brown or black. What I also learned is that this kind of covenant, this kind of policy was attached to thousands of homes uh, around St. Louis. If you have a home that, uh, that you own that was built in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, or even 60s, you probably have a document like that uh, attached to your home. Uh, I, I, I tried to figure out when those words were removed. When was this racially restrictive covenant taken away from my house? I didn't have to look very far to figure it out. It was removed on March 23rd, 19. 93. I don't know how old you were in 1993, but that wasn't very long ago. What I learned when I saw this and I began to research more is that these kinds of things that are just below the surface impact every aspect of our lives. If we look at where people live today in St. Louis, uh, there is a large correlation between where people live along racial lines today and where people were allowed to live throughout the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, uh, and then it even carried on unofficially 70s, 80s, 90s, and even today. Where you live impacts access to education, access to medicine, access to income, uh, home equity. Uh, can, can you generate wealth? It even impacts your life expectancy. What I realized is that people weren't living where they were living as a matter of preference, but there was a deeper issue at work. It was a, an issue of policy. 
And so if we're really going to reimagine race through the eyes of God, if we're really going to lean in and make the world the way that God wants us to make it, it's not enough uh, for us to just have our minds renewed. In fact, it's not enough just to have our hearts revived. We need to pray, God, strengthen my hands that I might be a part of rebuilding our world. You see, it's not just a matter of our souls, but God's calling us to revitalize and rebuild some of our structures. God, renew my mind. God, revive my heart. And then God, empower my hands to rebuild our world. When it comes to race, I would like to see a world where, and these are not my, my, my words, but a world where people's life outcomes are not determined by race. So you could look across um, educational outcomes, wealth, healthcare, all these various um, systems that operate in our society and in this world, and you can see the disparity that exists along racial lines. I just want people to be cognizant that, um, yes, there are individual instances with race, but there are also structural instances with race that then allow there to be structural inequality um, and produce some of the disparities that we see. If I was in charge of the world, here's what it would look like. <laughs> I, want it, I want it to go away. I want the racism to go away. There would be no racism if we just treated people the way we want to be treated, whether we liked them or not. I mean, if I simply treated my fellow man the way I want to be treated, it doesn't have opportunity to rear his ugly head. It just doesn't. So in my role as a law enforcement officer, um, I'd, I'd gotten a call uh, and, it, and it, it wasn't, there wasn't like a criminal element to this call, uh, but it was, it was uh, a teen. He was, I think he was 16, 17. Uh, he was having a bad day. I felt like this was one of those moments where I strip away the uniform and I had to have a human moment with someone. If we start from the premise that there is nothing inherently wrong or more wrong with black people than there are with other folks. Um, we start from that premise and then we look out and ask the question, okay, so why are these disparities in existence? Why are things the way they are? Um, I think the conclusion, maybe one of the only conclusions that you can come to is that there's something wrong with how this society is structured. Um, there's something structural. Um, there's something messed up about the way this is built. What the world needs now and has forever is love, sweet love, and Jesus' is love. And that's what, I, that's what I think. Something that I'm really thankful for is uh, the grace of people who um, have just been doing the work. And I, would, I don't think I would be handling it really well if I were them and someone like me you know, suddenly realized all this stuff. And um, I would be really annoyed by me. <laughs> and, uh, and sometimes I am annoyed by me, honestly. Um, but I'm really thankful for them. Maybe they are annoyed, but regardless, the faithfulness of people who have worked hard and done a good job of writing these books and drawing these lines and just data-ing it up. I'm so thankful for that hard work that has probably been largely thankless. And for all intents and purposes, still is. Because me realizing this is true isn't changing very much. But, you know, the real change that needs to happen is for people who um, can't ignore it and have never been able to. Allyship um, is a decision to show up for people even when they're not in the room. It's a decision to speak up for people, even if an issue doesn't directly impact you. And it's a decision from wherever you sit, from whatever position of power you may occupy, from whatever influence you may have, either formally or informally, to use your voice. I'd also love for us to just examine our systems, examine the places where we might perpetuate racism examine the systems, laws, policies, culture, where that can be uh, an issue. 
and to, to really discover and to think and to reflect upon that together. And that it's not um, a thing where we just do that alone, but that we do it in community, that we do it with our friends, with neighbors, with even our enemies, um, to work together, to think together, and to pray together. You know, and I told him, I was like, your, your life and where you're going, that's important, that matters, okay? Um, and, you know, you may not have anyone in your life right now that's effectively telling you that, but I care about the potential that you need to see in yourself. He looked at me and, and, and I could tell it was, it was a genuine moment. Do I know that I changed this kid's life? I, I don't know. But there was a moment of real, like, hey, you know what? Like, life sucks, but like, just because I'm feeling down doesn't mean that what I choose to do next doesn't matter. Allyship says, I'm gonna write a check to an organization that is um, fighting for justice. I'm going to volunteer my time. I am going to look around my own community, see some disparities, send an email to a council member, I am going to vote. I am going to challenge my family when they say things that are inappropriate. I am going to, um, to choose, even when it's not convenient, even when it's not comfortable, to speak up. I just want to encourage everybody um, that a lot of times these things may appear to be out of control, but but God is using it. God is, is definitely in um, this situation and hasn't lost control of the situation. If you don't intentionally include other people, you know, races, political background, whatever, into, you know, into things, then you will unintentionally exclude them, which I've done a little bit of, and I, I wanna do better with that. But there's no better time to start than right now, to just right this second. And it's from your mouth to God's ears, so stock. I start from that premise that, hey, all have, have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And all of us are imperfect and broken. And, and so the disparities that we see, the, the, the situations that we see, the circumstances that we see many folks in um, because they're, they're black or folks of color um, can only be explained away because of the arrangement. And so I think it's important for folks to recognize that and, um, and, and act accordingly. I tell myself I have to be reminded of, but I want the body of Christ to like buy into, you know what, like Christ calls us to, to go and we need to be willing to do that even if it's uncomfortable, even if it's awkward, even if it's the last thing we wanna do. In talking to my grandmother about the civil rights movement, I said, well, did you go to the March on Washington? Why didn't you go to Selma? I mean, I had questions. And she said, oh, I was fighting battles here. <laughs> I was fighting battles at my home, at my job, in my community. There were always battles. Those, that was the big picture. But all the little pictures along, you know, battles along the line uh, were something that we we're constantly fighting. Don't think because we weren't there that we didn't contribute. Then I became a soldier. So I started seeing things very differently. The small battles are how you win the war. It is so inspiring, so encouraging uh, to hear the passion and the zeal and the hope in the, in the voices and in the hearts of the members of One Family. I am so excited to be partnering with every one of you. I'm so grateful to be partnering with God, to, to do the work that God has called us to do. There's a lot of work to do, but there's joy in the work because we're not working alone. We're working arm in arm with our brothers and sisters. And even more importantly, we are working lockstep, in lockstep with God's vision and God's mission for this world. I'm grateful to be a part of that. And I know you are too. I'm gonna close out this series uh, by reading from Isaiah 58. I read from Isaiah the prophet last week. I just want to read a little further down in the passage. And I want to read this to you for those of you who might be growing a little weary and well-doing. Uh, for those of you who might be a little overwhelmed, 
by all of this talk about race and racism. For all of you who are hearing a lot of this for the first time, and for a lot of you who have been carrying this burden on your back uh, for your whole life, I want to end with some encouragement from the prophet Isaiah. God said this, said this to Isaiah, saying it to you. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, if you do this work, if you do away with the pointing finger and the malicious talk, and if you spend yourselves on behalf of the hungry, and you satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness, and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land, and He will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. You, your people, will rebuild the ancient ruins. You will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings. Do you realize what that means? What that means is that when you and I commit our lives, commit our hearts, commit our time, our talent, our money, our, our, our skills, our abilities to bringing justice, to bringing peace, to bringing restoration to the world. God shines upon that. God smiles upon that. God emboldens us. God empowers us. God will strengthen us. And at the end of the day, God wins. God wins every time. That means we can fight the fight with courage. That means we can fight the fight with hope. That means we can fight the fight with joy because we know we are on the side that wins. We know that God will answer the prayer that Jesus prayed in the, God, in the, in the garden. Father, make them one. We know that when it all ends, we will be one family. <laughs>